chapter 1, verse 1, he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. He said, Now there has been many that have taken in hand to do this. To do what? To set in order a declaration of things which are most surely believed among us. Now for those who take the position, it doesn't really matter what you believe, this verse will not support that. He says, they've taken in hand to bring forth a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Now there's one thing to believe something, it's another thing to most surely believe that. So I say to you and myself this morning, do we most surely believe certain things? Well, I don't mind going on record to tell you that I most surely believe in the creation. 
I must surely believe that God is our great creator God. I must surely believe I did not come from a monkey. I must surely believe that I'm part of Adam multiplied. I must surely believe in the virgin birth of Christ. I must surely believe in the resurrection. I must surely believe in the end of time. I must surely believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. I must surely believe in the sacrificial work of the Savior, that his death was a vicarious death, that he died in the room instead in place of a people that God gave him before time ever began, before the foundation of the world. In other words, I most surely believe in the doctrine of election. I most surely believe in what the Bible teaches about predestination. I most surely believe in the effectual call of sinners from a state of death and sin to a state of life in Jesus Christ. Now obviously the list is almost endless, isn't it? I can go on and on and on. But it's important that you believe the truth and you most surely believe it, okay? So that's an interesting way to start out this letter. He says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministry, ministers, excuse me, of the word. Now these people are identified as eyewitnesses of Jesus and ministers of the word. He says, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Now, anybody and everybody can't say this, but Luke could because God chose him in particular to do this. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, when you read Acts, which Luke, again, is the human writer of, but God being the author, you'll read Theophilus again in the very first verse of Acts chapter 1. So who was Theophilus? You say, well, it doesn't hardly say anything about him, Brother Lawrence. It's, um, I don't think we know hardly anything about him. Well, we probably know more about him than you think. It reminds me, Karen and I once in a while will watch some of these detective programs and they'll discover a body you know, that's been dead, let's say, for 50 to 75 years. And the first thought is, well, that's all they'll be able to do. They've just discovered somebody died, you know, a long, long time ago. All they found was a skeleton. But the next thing you know, they uh, have run a DN test. The next thing you know, they're able to tell that this was the body of a woman. This is the body of a man. Next thing you know, they're able to say, well, this was a young woman, an old woman, or a young man, an older man. Uh, the next thing you know, they're doing uh, dental comparisons. And one thing, the first thing you know, they didn't find out who that person is. And in the beginning, all you got there is a skeleton, right? So that's the way it is sometimes with the scriptures. You just, you read something and you think, well, uh, that's about all you know. But that's not true. Who was Theophilus? Well, first of all, we know he was an acquaintance of Luke. He, he was somebody that Luke knew very well. Also, the word Theophilus means friend of God, means lover of God. Theophilus, without a question, was a person of high rank somewhere in the Roman government. And the reason I say that is because I go to the book of Acts, chapter 23 and 24 and 26. You know, you read about two men, one named Festus, one named Felix. And this was a time when the Apostle Paul was a prisoner and he interacted with them, and when he spoke to them, here's how he spoke. Oh, excellent Felix. Oh, noble Festus. When the word excellent and most excellent, the word noble is precedes somebody's name, then it always tells you that that's a person who occupies some type of important position. And Luke knew him. Luke was very well acquainted with him. And he mentions him in both letters in the very beginning, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, both are addressed to this man named Theophilus. Now, he means again, friend of God, a lover of God. I'm convinced without any question that Theophilus was a believer. And he was a believer, as I've already said, more than just being a casual believer, he knew things he most surely believed. So Luke directs these two letters to this man knowing this man would believe what these letters said because they give him a divine inspiration. Notice what else he says here. 
The expression, by the way, of all things from the very first. That expression, very first, literally means from above. So what's he telling me here? He's telling me this letter that I'm writing right here has come from above. It's not my ideas, it's not my thoughts, it's not speculation, imagination, something I dream. It has come from above. Just like 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That's what he's saying right here. This letter I'm writing, I just didn't come up with it on my own. It came from above. Then he says that thou mightest know the certainty of those things. We're not talking about uncertain things here. We're talking about certain things. Everything I've already mentioned, I must surely believe. I believe we can declare and prove without any question, without any doubt, the certainty of these things. I want to be certain about certain things, don't you? I, I, I want to be certain about it. I want to know those things I most surely believe. Now, if I'm going to do that, uh, the Bible's not a lazy man's book. You know, they get the forensic team out there, as I was giving that illustration a little bit earlier, and they spent a lot of time examining that 50 or 75 year old body they found. It's nothing now but a skeleton, but because they have expertise in their field, they're able to come up with some answers of who that person was. And so can we if we take the same approach to God's word. That's the end of the year. Uh, I trust that you're zeroing in and completing reading the Bible this past year, 2023. I'm right on schedule. I stay right on it. I don't ask you to do anything I don't do. And they're already out there January, February, March for 2024, so you can grab one and get ahead and get started here. The new year is right around the corner, so it's right available to you. You don't have to use that one. You can use one you get from somewhere else. You make up your own one, but the thing is, you need to get into it. Make it part of your fiber. Make it part of your person. So now notice this. The now minus of the certainty of those things, wherein thou has been instructed. The word instruct is where we get the word catechism, which simply means the basics of Christianity. Now we don't have something like that per se here, but we have something in, you might say comparable, we have what we call articles of faith. If you don't have the articles of faith of this church here, which are gonna be very, very similar, almost identical in every primitive Baptist church throughout the country, then you certainly need to get one and you need to be familiar with it and you need to study it because we list there at least uh, in most churches gonna be 10 to 12 articles of faith. I think we got about 20 at Bethel here and there are scriptural reference, so get it and you go down, you know, item by item by item by item, there's the article of faith, here are the scriptural references so that you might so surely believe these things and know with a certainty this is what the Bible teaches. So I think it's important we notice the first four verses here of the Gospel of Luke. Now I've already stated Luke is a physician. Luke is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Colossians 4.14, 2 Timothy 4 and 11 for two examples. We know as he writes the book of Acts that there are several passages in the book of Acts where you will read the word we. When you read the word we, that means Luke is involved. When you read the word we in the book of Acts, that means Luke is with Paul on whatever journey Paul is on. You remember one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Acts chapter 27, when Paul and them are on that ship on the way to Rome, and eventually through a tremendous storm at sea, that ship is totally destroyed, but Paul and all the prisoners on that ship are delivered safely. Luke is with him on that ship. So when you see the word we, that means Luke is a companion of Paul. That happens, I think, three different times in the book of Acts. So Luke now, this physician, God has chosen him as a, as a man, as an individual, but again, his profession is that a physician. That tells me something. Luke is, must be somewhat a very intelligent individual, educated individual for that day. And God's gonna use him to emphasize the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ more than Mark or Matthew or John. Now John's gonna emphasize the deity and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. So the opening verses here in Luke chapter one is about a man named Zacharias who has a wife in the name of Elizabeth. And they're old and well stricken in years. And an angel comes down from heaven that's identified as Gabriel. 
Now, Gabriel is going to be sent from heaven to bring a message to Zacharias. He's going to be sent from heaven to bring a message unto Mary. But I also find Gabriel brought a message over here to a man by the name of Daniel in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel, chapter 9, is written about 538 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, angels live a long time. No, angels don't just live a long time. Angels don't die. Angels are created beings who do not die. Gabriel's on the job 538 years before he ever comes and speaks unto Zacharias and speaks unto Mary. Now the Lord sent him to Daniel. Now he sends him to Zacharias. And tells Zacharias, thy prayer has been heard. And he tells Zacharias, and listen, this wife is going to conceive and bring forth a son. And he shall be great. And the Holy Ghost shall be upon him from his mother's womb. Remember that. We'll come back to that, Lord willing, for the Lord to help us. Zacharias, in verse 18, questions this. In verse 18, Zacharias says, How shall these things be, seeing that we're very old and well stricken in years? In other words, we are past the ability, the capability of having a child. That statement is said in unbelief because the angel then tells him he will not be able to speak for nine months because thou believest not the words that were spoken to thee. Now it's one thing to believe the promise of God. It's another thing to have questions about the performance of God. There's nothing wrong with that. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul says, Great is the mystery of godliness. There's a mystery about godliness. What is a mystery if it's not something that provokes questions in your mind and, and a curiosity, you know, concerning what's under consideration? Behold, he says, the mystery of godliness is great. Great is the mystery of godliness. And the very first thing it said is God manifest in the flesh. That's the virgin birth of Christ. Well, the same angel is going to bring a message to Mary later on in this chapter. So we have two men brought to our attention in Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ, that both will experience supernatural births in this world or conceptions and then births in this world. Zacharias, from the womb of a woman who is too old to have a child, fathered by Zacharias is too old, too old to father a child, unless God is in the arrangement. Unless God is in the arrangement. Then we have Mary, who's never known a man, she's a virgin. Yes, she's going to have a child. God is going to supernaturally intervene on her behalf for her to have a child. So let's just go to verse 35 now. Luke 1, 35. Here we're going to find an answer that Gabriel the angel gives to Mary. Because just above this, Mary also, like Zacharias, asked how shall these things be, seeing I know not a man. You say, Brother Lawrence, what's the difference in Zacharias' response and Mary's response? Well, I've already given you, Zacharias didn't believe the promise. Mary believes the promise, she just don't understand the performance. You understand the difference between promise and performance? I believe in the resurrection. I believe that's the promise of God. There's going to be a resurrection. Now, I got questions about the performance of it, you might say. Not that it won't be performed, but just how will it take place? How will these bodies of ours can be raised from the dead? And they'll be changed bodies, not exchanged bodies, but changed bodies. It'll be a natural body that goes down, a spiritual body that comes up, a body of weakness that goes down, a body of power that comes up, a body of corruption that goes down, a body of incorruption that comes up, a body of dishonor that goes down, but a body of glory that should be raised up. Not an exchanged body, same body, but it goes down four ways, it comes up four ways. I believe that. That's a promise. That's going to take place. I, I believe that. That's one of the things I most certainly believe. But the performance of it is another thing. Behold, again, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh. Let me get the rest of that. God manifests in the flesh, seen among angels, justified in the spirit, preached on among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received back up into glory. You see that cycle? Each, each part of that? There's a mystery to each part of that. It's a mystery about how he was justified in the Spirit. There's a mystery of how he was preached among the Gentiles. It's a mystery of how he was believed on in the world. There's a mystery how he was received back up into glory. That's all the great mystery. But it, if you want to know all about it, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll find out a lot more about that. 
So let's see what it says in Matthew 135, because this is the angel's answer to Mary's question. The Holy Ghost shall be upon thee, and the power of the house shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. You notice the word thee, T-H-E-E, -E, mentioned three times. That's Mary, of course, she's the thee all three times. The Holy Ghost shall be upon thee. Now I'm reading back in Luke 1, I think again verse 18 I already mentioned, where the angel is telling Zacharias that Elizabeth is going to have this child and the child be a son, I shall call his name John. Just like the angel says unto Mary and Joseph what Jesus' name is going to be, they say what John's name is going to be. His name should be called John, which means beloved. It says he shall be great. And he shall neither eat, uh, uh, indeed he shall drink uh, wine or strong drink. He was going to be a Nazarite. And so he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Let's remember that. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. A little further over in the chapter, we're going to find where Mary and Martha get together in the hill country. They were cousins. Mary goes to where Elizabeth is at, to a town in Judea. And they meet, and they visit, and they talk. But here's Martha's initial, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth's initial response. She said, at your salutation, at your greeting, the babe that's in my womb leapt for joy at this, your salutation, and the Holy Ghost filled Elizabeth. Now we got John the Baptist going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Ghost at this, on this occasion right here. And we notice how John the Baptist, in his mother's womb, actually leapt, and he leapt for joy. Something stimulated him. And Elizabeth says it was a salutation of Mary. So we're looking at a mystery right here, aren't we? Here's two women who are carrying a child. Elizabeth is carrying John the Baptist. Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus Christ. Elizabeth is six months ahead of Mary. They get together and Mary comes on the scene and speaks to Elizabeth. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist in her mother womb, his mother's womb, uh, supernaturally, by the divine intervention, hears the salutation of Mary and causes him to leap for joy. So what are we to learn about all of that? Well, we're going to learn one thing. John the Baptist was born in the Spirit of God before he was ever born naturally. John the Baptist had the Spirit of God inside his little heart and soul before he ever saw the light of day. And he leapt for joy. He just didn't move around like unborn children do. They're always doing that. You know, women, a mother's talk about, I got a little football player, I got a little soccer player apparently going to be here. All this moving, going around. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this child leapt. And he leapt for joy because the sound of the mother's voice that was carrying Jesus Christ, the voice of Mary. She's filled with the Holy Ghost. After Zacharias is able to speak again nine months down the road, we find where John the Baptist is born. And when he was born, we find family and friends coming to the gathering like people always do. And they call his name Zacharias. But his mother said, no, his name is not Zacharias. His name is John. They said, we don't have anybody, he don't have anybody in his family named John. So they, they appealed to Zacharias. Zacharias asked for a writing table. He wrote on it, his name is John. <laughs> his name is John. And when he said his name is John, his tongue was loosed. And the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we got John the Baptist filled with the Holy Ghost. We got his mother's fi mother filled with the Holy Ghost. We got his father filled with the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, right after the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find the Bible says Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now we're talking about the Son of God. Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost was led of the Spirit up into the mountain. Here's where he's going to have the temptation, of course, confrontation with Satan on the mountain of temptation. But what's it say about Jesus in the beginning? Before Jesus encountered Satan in this confrontation, the Bible says he was fully filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Come to Luke, chapter, back to Luke chapter two, there's a man named Simeon. And the Bible says that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel and was filled with the Holy Ghost. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death till he had seen the Lord's Christ. I got a point I'm working toward. We got John the Baptist, we got Elizabeth, we got Zacharias, we got Mary, we got the Lord Jesus Christ all being filled with the Holy Ghost. We got Simeon being filled with the Holy Ghost. In 1 John 5, 7, the Bible says that three of our record having the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The office of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is a very important office. It has multiple functions. One of them is to born people of the Spirit of God. Another one is to fill people already born of the Spirit of God with the fullness of God. You see, it must have been a great thing living back in that day and age when you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, let's just take a look at another verse. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Paul writes to this church and he says, For our gospel came not to you in word only, but it came in three different ways. It came not in word only. It came in the word, but not in word only. It came in power. It came in the Holy Ghost. And it came in much assurance. So I'm going to ask a question this morning. Paul was a New Testament minister and apostle. He was writing to a New Testament church. He said our gospel came not in word only, but it came in power. It came in the Holy Ghost. It came in much assurance. It came in three different ways. Is that your experience in coming here? Is that your experience already this morning? Has the word of God come to you? Has the gospel come to you already this morning in word but not word only? Has it come in power? If not, why not? Has it come in the Holy Ghost? If not, why not? Has it come in much assurance? If not, why not? Paul says when he preached it, it came in the word, it came in the power, it came in the Holy Ghost, and it came in much assurance. I'm here to tell you this morning, that's the way it still comes. When you're blessed to be in the household of faith, in God's house, in the Lord's house, hearing somebody speak from the Lord's word to the Lord's people, and you have the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ here, he's made himself known in his house, you should be able to receive the word of God in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Do you have a shirt already this morning greater than you had before you got here? I hope you have. Amen. I maybe hadn't already told you anything too much new. Maybe a few things about Theophilus. But the Lord is here and you feel the Lord in your heart stirring your mind and your heart on the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ then that word is coming to you and not just in word only, it's coming to you in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance you're in a blessed place in a blessed state. Don't take it for granted. You know, I was telling you this morning where a n- number of our members are at, you know, just so you know why they're not here, they normally here. I'm going to tell you where a lot of people are at this morning because I saw it. The parking lot at Cracker Barrel was packed. <laughs> packed. I went there on an emergency trip to pick up a chocolate pecan pie for later on in, in Regina's at Mark's house. <laughs> I, this morning I was up and at it. I was fortunate to find a parking place. Packed. There's where the masses always are at. There's where the masses are always at. I live near a golf course. So, most time no matter what the weather is, we leave, there's golfers out there golfing on Sunday morning. But you know, I'm not going to be too hard on them because I know except for the grace of God that could be me out there. Except for the grace of God, I might have had a greater interest in filling my stomach with pancakes and eggs this morning at Cracker Barrel than being in the house of God, feasting upon the word of God, taking care of my spiritual appetite, that might be me now. So be happy and be thankful this morning. You're where you're at. You're where you're at. For the gospel is to the soul what natural food is to the body. But again, it was packed. (laughs) 
All right, the Holy Ghost shall be upon her. That's the angel's answer to Mary. The angel's going to explain to Mary the performance of the promise. The Holy Ghost shall be upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That word highest is spelled with a capital H. That means that's a title of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, before I forget it, we see the Trinity in this statement. The Holy Ghost, third person in the Godhead, shall be upon thee. The power of the highest, that's God the Father, shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing that shall be born of thee, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You got the Holy Ghost, you got the Father, and you got the Son, all embracing this statement right here. The Holy Ghost shall be upon thee, and the power of the highest. So, what about this highest? The first time the word highest is used in the Bible is in Psalms 18, 13. It says, the Lord thundered from heaven and the voice of the highest, capital H, was heard. But the first time the expression most high is used in the Bible is over here in the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 14, Abraham, when he's known as Abram, has taken 300 uh, servants of his, trained servants, gone out to battle, 318, I think, gone out to battle, and he's rescued Lot, his nephew, and all that the kings had taken uh, into captivity in their battle with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and other kings. Brings them all back. On the way back, he meets a man by the name, a, a priest by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek speaks unto Abel and says, I am the priest of the Most High God. He says, and blessed art thou, Abel, of the Most High God. And blessed be Abel of the Most High God who has delivered you from your enemies. Melchizedek says, I'm the priest of the Most High God and then blesses Abraham twice in the name of the Most High God. Then the king of Sodom comes to Abram, it says, give me the persons and you take the goods. And Abraham says, I'll not take from a shoe latchet to a thread to a shoe latchet. He says, because I come in the name of the Most High. Abram called on quick, didn't he? Abram didn't forget that expression of Melchizedek to him that he used three different times. You've been blessed of the Most High God, be delivered from your enemies. You've been blessed of the Most High God who hath delivered you giving you these things, I'm the priest of the Most High God. And then we find it used 48 times more, or 47 more times, 44 more times, to get it right in a minute. Altogether, it's used 48 times. Interesting, it's used twice, only twice in the New Testament besides right here. You know the first time it's used? It's used by the wild Gadarene in Luke chapter 8. The guy, wild Gadarene, he says, what have I to do with thee, O thou Jesus, thou Son of God of the Most High? The wild Gadarene recognized who Jesus was. The Son of God of the Most High. And then Stephen, in writing his defense, his history of Israel in Acts chapter 7, comes along and says, for, God, for, he says, for the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Ecclesiastes 5 and 8 says, there is one higher than the high. If there's one higher than the high, that makes him the highest, right? Solomon says there's one higher than the high. He's talking about God Almighty. He says, she shall be overshadowed by the power of the most high. I love these expressions. I love these little words, these little words that are so powerful and so significant in the Word of God. She shall be overshadowed. Now, the expression overshadowed has reference to an Old Testament picture I want you to see. She shall be overshadowed by the power of the Most High. In the tabernacle, in the temple, you had a place called the Holy Place. And then as you went through the Holy Place, you got to a place called the Most Holy Place, or the Holy of the Holy. Okay? In the first holy place in the tabernacle, you had the altar of incense here, 
You had the table of showbread here. You had the candlestick over here. You went through the veil to the most holy place or the holiest of the holies. In that most holy place, the holiest of the holies, there was an Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was made out of shining wood overlaid with pure gold. And on the inside, you're going to find the golden pot of manna. You're going to find Aaron's rod that budded and the two tables of the law. On top of that is the mercy seat overlaid with pure gold. The shining wood represents the humanity of Christ. The gold represents the glory of Christ. But what I want you to see is this. On each end of the mercy seat's two cherubims. The cherubims are winged creatures of God's creation. You got the seraphims, you got the cherubims. And these cherubims stretch forth their wings just like this to where they touch each other and their eyes look right down upon the mercy seat what have you got a picture of? You got a picture of the all-seeing eye and protective hand of God upon that Ark of the Covenant. It says, she shall be with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost shall be upon her, and the power of the highest shall overshadow her. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ is in the womb of Mary, the holiest of the holy. You know where should be the safest place for, for a person in this world? Where would you think the safest place ought to be? I'd say the safest place a person ought to experience and be in this world is when that person's in the womb of its mother. Is that the safest place today? Is that the safest place today? I'd say it's one of the most dangerous places today. In some cases, it's the most dangerous place for an individual to be is in the womb of a woman. It should be the safest place. And thank God in the majority of people it's still the safest place. The safest place I've ever been in my entire life when I was in the womb of my mother. And I think I could probably say that about each and every one of you here this morning. The safest place you have ever been in your life is when you was in the womb of your mother because your mother loved you and was thankful to God for you and done everything possible to take care of you. Even when you was there in her womb, she did all she possibly could to be sure you might be the healthiest little baby you could possibly be. And so the Lord says concerning Mary, or oh, the angel does and answer her question, the Holy Ghost shall be upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Uh, <clears throat> the clock is stopped, so I don't really know what time it is. Oh, I do have this. Okay. The power of the high shall overshadow thee. Let's think about that for a second. What's going to overshadow her? The, not just the highest, the power of the highest. It's the power of the highest that's enabled her to conceive to begin with the Son of God in this world. What about the power of the highest? Is there a power greater than the power of the highest? I hear about horsepower. I hear about hydroelectric power. I hear about atomic power. I'm trying to tell you about a power that puts all these powers to shame. Yeah, amen. I'm talking about the power that said, let there be light, and there was light. I'm talking about a power that created the heaven and the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the universe. Everything that's out there was created by the hand of God. That's the kind of power of the highest I'm talking about. I'm talking about the power of the highest that took, blew a strong east wind upon the Red Sea and it parted two great walls of water and the entire nation of people crossed dry shot to the other side. And then the power of the highest brought those two power, uh, walls of uh, water right down upon the Egyptian army and drowned every single one of them in the Red Sea. The power of the highest. I'm talking about the power of the highest that sent his angels and shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was in the den of the lions and he got a good night's sleep that night. I'm talking about the power of the highest that sheltered the Hebrew children in a fire burning furnace that was heated seven times hotter than normal and was heated so great that those who cast them in was consumed in the very beginning. And yet there was not a hair of their head singed, not a, hair, uh, not a, a smell of smoke on their clothes, or a, head, a hair on their head was singed. I'm talking about the power of the highest. I'm talking about the power of the highest that calmed this raging storm when the disciples in that ship in a storm in Matthew chapter 8, when they cried to the Lord, care not that we perish, that storm was so great, they saw themselves about ready to perish and drown in that sea under the power of the highest. 
I'm talking about the power of the highest that told Paul in Acts chapter 27 that ship would uh, be smashed to smithereens. But everybody on that ship would be landed safely to shore and it took place just like the Lord said. I'm talking about the power of the highest that spoke to a man by the name of Lazarus. Called him out of, out of a tomb when he'd been dead for four days. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He came forth immediately. No hesitation, no delay, no procrastination. Came forth immediately. I'm talking about the power of the highest, right? I'm talking about the power of the highest that enables you to believe what I'm saying this morning. What am I saying this morning? Without the power of the highest inside of you, you wouldn't believe a word I'm saying. If the power of the highest had not spoken to you sometime in your past and born you of the Spirit of God, born you from above, you wouldn't even be here this morning. Much less believe what I'm saying. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul asked the question. He says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So I'm talking about the power. Our gospel came not in you in word only, it came in power. Every time the gospel is preached, you hear the gospel, you witness the gospel being preached, and you experience the gospel being preached, you're witnessing a modern day New Testament miracle of God's power. So the Holy Ghost shall be with thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing, the Lord's called a thing right here. <laughs> that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called what? Son of God. He did not say that holy thing that's born of thee shall become the Son of God. He said that holy thing that's born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now we have the fulfillment of some prophecy. We take a look at uh, Isaiah seven fourteen. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son that shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23 says this is when it came to pass. Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, humanity, a son is given, divinity. See that? His humanity, his deity, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We find the scripture fulfilled, aren't we? That holy thing. Let's emphasize the word holy here because this is the only person in biblical history that's ever been said about. No one had ever been, had never been said about anybody prior to this and about anybody since this time that that which come forth from a mother's womb was a holy thing. You know what the Bible says about mankind come from his mother's womb in the book of Psalms? The wicked are strange from the womb, speaking lies. You can't be called a holy thing. I can't be called a holy thing because we've got an unholy nature about us. We've got a sinful nature, but not this one. Jesus Christ called a holy thing. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Notice, he sent his son. Before this took place, the son was in glory. When the fullest time has come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us that was under the law. Made of a woman. He was a son before this ever happened. He didn't become the son of God when he was conceived in Mary's womb. He was already the son of God. He became the son of man. That's, that's critical. That's basic Christian doctrine that's critical that a lot of people don't believe what I just said. John 1, 14, for the word, second person of Godhead, for the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. That word spelled with a capital W, W W-O-R-D, second person of Godhead. The word was made what? Flesh, virgin birth of Christ, the immaculate virgin birth of Christ, not the immaculate virgin. There's no such thing as that. Okay, And I know that for lots of reasons. <laughs> lots of reasons. Mary had a sinful mother and a sinful father as far as her nature is concerned, and she inherited it. You know, a lot of times the boys <laughs> take a look at me. 
And they're thinking, now, what am I going to get from Dad as I get older? Less hair. <laughs> Hearing aids. <laughs> they say, uh-oh, I, I see trouble down the road. <laughs> but see, I gave them something a long time ago that when, when they were born, they got my nature. They got my nature. And you got your mother and father's nature. And Mary got her mother and father's nature. So here's why she says what she does in Luke chapter 2. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary's got to have a Savior? Of course she does. Do you know that 50% total wise, 50% of so called the world of, you, of Christianity believe that Mary is perfect and sinless or was? They believe that. They're taught that. The Word of God teaches opposite of that. My soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary had a Savior. She wasn't a sinner, she wouldn't need a Savior. So the Holy Ghost shall be upon thee, the power of hast shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing that she's born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now let's take a look briefly at two significant events that took place right after the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 records a visitation from some wise men. Luke chapter 2 records a visitation of some shepherds. The shepherds come to where the Lord Jesus Christ is after he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. The wise men make their visit after the Lord Jesus Christ is away from the manger, out of the manger. He's a young child and in a house. They do not occur at the same time. So we go to Matthew chapter 2 and we find where the wise men see a star. Notice three things about the wise men's response to this. The wise men come to Jerusalem. They say, where is he that's born king of the Jews? These wise men were not Jews. But it's been revealed unto them the Jews have a king. They've come to see the king of the Jews. Where is he that's born king of the Jews? So we have seen his star. Not a star. We've seen his star. A star specifically identified with Jesus. We've seen his star, and we've come to worship him. The wise men came to worship. The wise people still come to worship. The wise men still come to worship. The wisdom that people you got from God in the hearts and minds of God's people, the wise people still come to worship. They come to Jerusalem. That's not where he's at. But the Bible says that Herod and all those in Jerusalem were very, very concerned about this. Remember later on when the angel is going to tell the shepherds that unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, which should be good news unto all people? Let me ask you this question. Did, was Herod happy? Did, should that not teach you then that the word all is used in a restrictive sense almost every time you read it? Herod was not happy. He demanded of the wise men what time his star appeared so he could try to pinpoint this. And then he told them, you go and search diligence for the child. When you find him, you come back and tell me so I can go worship him. We know all along Herod wanted to slay him. So then the star reappears, like the star disappeared. For a while now the star reappears and guides him to Bethlehem. Where they came into the house, not, not the stable. They came into the house where the young child was. And they brought three different types of gifts. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Three valuable things that Joseph and Mary were going to need because Joseph and Mary were poor, had no money, and shortly after this, they're going to have to take a trip all the way down to Egypt. they got to have some finances, and God provides it by the wise men. Isn't that something? Just like God provided Joseph and Mary with with the financial means by the wise men, he can do the same for you and the same for me if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, there's a lot more to be said about this, but let's just shift over here to Luke chapter 2 because now the Lord's going to send some angels to a group of people, shepherds, watching their flocks on the hillsides of Bethlehem at, at night, and the shepherds appear, and the Bible says that the angel of God came upon them, and the glory of God came around them. Get the picture. 
You're out there, you're a shepherd, going through your daily routine, watching over a flock of sheep that's been your duty responsibility perhaps for years and years and years. Here's another day, here's another night, but all of a sudden angels appear and the glory of God is all around you. And that's why they broke out and said, a new is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord, which will be a good news unto all people. And all of a sudden there was a heavenly host with them praising God, saying, peace on earth, good will toward men, glory to God, where? In the highest, in the highest is where the most high is at, right? And they come and they find Jesus, just like the angel said, he says, you will find him wrapped in swallowing clothes and laid in a manger. That's exactly where they, where they found him and how they found him. And they saw him and his mother, and they, like the wise men did, the Bible says the wise men found him and his mother and worshiped him. Not them, but worshiped him. Then they returned, and the Bible says when they returned, they were found praising and glorifying the Lord. I want to close this morning with one of the most important statements in the Bible. In Luke chapter 1, after the angel has come down, told Zacharias about Elizabeth's going to have a child. After the angel has come to Mary and told her the same thing. And by the way, the angel came to Ma uh, Joseph, go to Matthew 1, 20, 21. Joseph is concerned. He knows Mary's with child. He knows they've not been together. He's concerned that she has been unfaithful to him. And the angel comes and calms his fear. Says unto Joseph, fear not. That which is conceived in the womb of Mary is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son that shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I most certainly believe that. I most certainly believe she brought forth a child. I most certainly believe they called his name Jesus. And I most certainly believe he saved E.D., his people, his people from their sins. You believe that? Or do you most certainly believe that? I most certainly believe that, right? So when Mary asked the question, how should these things be seen? I know not a man. And the angel gives the answer I just went over. The angel then makes this statement. For there is nothing impossible with God. For there is nothing impossible with God. And we've just read about two impossible things made possible by God.